Hello, welcome to this inaugural event. It's the first in an interesting series entitled Do Great Minds Think Alike? Uh, and the title of this first in the series is called Tackling Trafficking Through Digital Tech. And I have two great minds with me today uh, who come from the fields of human trafficking in law and digital tech and AI and human rights. The event is being hosted by the Alan Turing Institute and the Dixon Poon School of Law at King's College London. My name is Anna Lutfi, I'm a human rights barrister, a legal researcher and the host of a legal podcast at King's College London called The Verdict. The Verdict, we believe, is an innovative approach to podcasting which brings together experts in dialogue on some of the pressing issues of our time with a view to actually enacting meaningful social, legal and policy changes. And with me to discuss trafficking and digital tech is Professor Parosha Chandran, who is one of the UK's, let's say, the UK's leading anti-slavery lawyer, an award-winning human rights barrister and professor of practice in slavery law at King's College London, and Dr Anjali Mazumda, the lead at the Alan Turing Institute in the field of artificial intelligence for human rights. And I hope, Anjali, you'll be able to explain the four to us uh, in the course of this discussion. We will be taking questions at the end. There's a Q&A section, so make sure that you use the Slido link in the chat function if you're watching. Uh, and let's, let's start. I would like to ask you both what kind of work you've been doing uh, in the field of slavery and human trafficking. Parosha, can we start with you and then move to Anjali? Thank you very much, Anna. Well, um, I've been a barrister. Next year it will be 25 years, actually, in practice. Um, and what I've been doing over certainly the last 20 years is representing victims of human trafficking uh, and modern slavery in their court cases by bringing test case after test case to establish rights protection where I found gaps in the law. Um, in addition to my cases, I've uh, been a legal advisor and expert for the UN and, and am currently uh, for the OSCE and for the Council of Europe. I also train judges, prosecutors uh, in the field and um, actually I now advise governments and um, Commonwealth states uh, as the senior legal advisor to the British Parliament's Modern Slavery Project. So for me, I, I always look at things from a human rights perspective. That's what I studied at the beginning of my practice. And I try to move the trajectory of combating trafficking closer towards protecting victims when they get forgotten sometimes in, in what everybody's talking about. Thank you. I hope we'll be able to return to the idea of how tech can assist victims and how tech sometimes fails to assist or protect victims as we, as we progress. But Anjali, what sort of work have you been doing in the field of AI and human rights as it connects to Parosha's work? Thank you, uh, Anna. So the work uh, that I've been undertaking at the Alan Turing Institute has prioritised really an area of work around how we can use data science and artificial intelligence, and I should qualify that by saying what we often mean is machine learning methods uh, to really uh, tackle and address modern slavery and human trafficking from a range of areas and issues to how could we better understand the, um, the issues or the factors that might uh, affect or cause people to engage in situations that would put them at risk of being exploited to uh, how we could better detect that modern slavery is occurring, uh, all the way to how, what we can do in terms of the courts. So once we know that there is a case of modern slavery, what is the evidence that can be used, evaluated, and then interpreted for the courts? Thank so you. Quite a range. How big of a problem is this phenomenon? We, we, we've called this talk um, tackling trafficking, but for many of us, it's not absolutely clear what trafficking is and how, and how much of a problem it is and why, why we need solutions and what we need solutions to. I, I don't know if, Parosha, you could speak to that and then Anjali. <clears throat> sure. So the legal definition of trafficking, which is the UN definition, tells us that trafficking is one of five acts, recruitment, receipt, harboring, transportation, or um, harboring, uh, uh, transferring a person for the purpose of exploitation. And in the case of an adult, they should have been subjected to what I call a trafficking trap, but what in law is called one of the means, which is that they were deceived, coerced, threatened, abducted, or <clears throat> their 
vulnerability was abused. Uh, ultimately, it's the aim of the trafficker to exploit the person, and the exploitation may be one of several forms, sexual exploitation, forced labor, slavery, servitude, removal of organs. We see increasingly a preponderance of the use of victims for criminal activities by traffickers. Um, and so some of these cases are often not detected as cases of human trafficking and often victims come to the attention of the authorities as potential offenders themselves and, and we see very egregious uh, violations of human rights when we see the prosecution of victims who have been um, actually trafficked and are being exploited at the time of the unlawful offence. When you say actually trafficked, and I'm going to turn to Anjali now, I mean, you're conjuring up a very physical, material reality of horrible exploitation of physical bodies, adults, children. Um, so it's hard for us to sort of put that in a, in a cyber context, if you will, and understand the relevance of this phenomenon for those who are working in AI. So uh, are you able to say a little bit, Anjali, about how tech plays a role in trafficking, both in terms of the traffickers and the people that want to stop traffickers, law enforcement, for example, and you might want to ch chime in uh, as, you, as you feel. Sure. So I think, and as you've sort of uh, alluded to here, there's, it, there's almost a double-edged sword. So one is that we've seen in the fourth industrial revolution, as we say, just uh, new technologies, smartphones, the, the rising sort of availability of the internet has just meant that uh, we can... Uh, perpetrators are now able to recruit through some of these means. Uh, there's more risk of exploitation of victims on a larger scale. At the same time, there is the opportunity for us to potentially use these same technologies to prevent and detect what's happening. Um, and I think getting back to sort of Parosha's points in terms of both the definition, but also just really the issues and the means is sort of getting what we're aiming to do through uh, data is to understand can we detect these often really subtle um, distinguishing sort of features about is it coercion when you see it if there's messages being sent can you tell that that's coercion or not and it's it's trying to understand whether or not there are signals in the data that could help to elude um, in many cases, law enforcement to be able to better detect and therefore intervene. Shift the needle earlier so that um, individuals aren't put into a situation of being uh, exploited, trafficked for a longer period of time. Is that an example of what you might call digital evidence or have I got that phrase completely wrong? And um, what, 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 how, how does digital evidence feature in both of your work uh, in relation to um, human trafficking? Um, what, what's, what's its function and <coughs> what are the problems with it? Um, if you just want to meditate on that concept of digital evidence. So, for example, in one of my cases, uh, it exposes how there was a complete absence of any interest in pursuing what was available in terms of uh, evidence um, that was technological. Yeah. Uh, so, for example, uh, in a case that I've recently won before the European Court of Human Rights, the case of AN and the United Kingdom. Landmark judgment, yes. Landmark judgment, yes, indeed, thank you, um, in the field of um, recognising positive obligations on the state to identify victims and to prevent them from being prosecuted. Um, I was representing a child, AN, in that case, who had been trafficked into a cannabis factory. The yield of drugs was massive. It was between £500,000 worth and a million pounds worth of drugs when he was found. The children, he was one of two or three other children, um, were sleeping on a sheet on a concrete um, uh, floor. The windows were bricked in and the door was bolted from the outside to protect the harvest of cannabis from intruders. He was from Vietnam. Now, when the police came upon those circumstances, uh, which happened because uh, burglars ram-raided the side of the building to steal the drugs, and in the commotion, neighbors called the police, the police immediately arrested all of the children the um, police then uh, charged them with the cultivation of cannabis. 
the prosecutor prosecuted them for the same offence. Their defence lawyer told them to plead guilty and the convicting judge decided to um, yeah, convict them and send them to a term of punishment that included detention. Now, when I brought the case on appeal, uh, originally in the UK, it was in 2011, and it was, it was 10 years ago, and it was heard in 2012 when I lost it before the Court of Appeal and had to then send it to Strasbourg and wait nearly a decade for the outcome. But at the time, I was staggered when I saw, firstly, all the mistakes that all the lawyers and the judges and the police had made, but also, when I read his account to the police, he had explained that uh, on his mobile phone was the telephone number of one of the main traffickers, that the trafficker was attending the premises every Tuesday and Thursday to bring products and provisions for basically the child prisoners inside. But the police had no interest or training to appreciate that that was the best evidence and intelligence that was available to them in order to actually bring down the whole trafficking network. And so it took many uh, attempts by me to establish the non-punishment of, of victims of trafficking in the UK in order to get a, a, a change in that. I will just stay on this point because mm. having lost that case in 2012 and, lodged it, and having lodged it in Strasbourg, I wasn't taking no for an answer, because I, I know Strasbourg can sometimes take time. So I brought another case the following year in 2013, again for a Vietnamese child a victim of trafficking who had been uh, convicted of cannabis cultivation. And I was able to persuade the appeal court to quash his conviction. Now the relevance of that is that for the first time in English history, we then had an appreciation of the non-punishment of victims of trafficking. And what that directly led to in 2014 is something that then links with Anjali's work, which is that when we were having this proliferation of children being trafficked up and down the country for county line drugs cases, where they were ordinarily being prosecuted for the supply and possession of crack and heroin, suddenly there was an appreciation that they were in fact victims mm -hmm. of a larger network that really needed to be investigated and brought down. Two things occurred when then a prosecution uh, was brought of the trafficking gang. One was that none of the children were um, in a position to give evidence in court. They were all terrified and fearful of their lives. One of them had even had a gun, had been stripped naked and had a gun placed in his mouth by oh. one of the traffickers and told that uh, he'd know his own fate if he didn't uh, succumb to their um, demands. And so in each one of those cases, there were five children aged between 14 and 19, and all the intercept evidence was used as uh, the first victimless prosecution in the UK. So they took the data from the phones to show the citation of each child and the citation of the trafficker, to show that there was a, a, a meeting. They looked at the train receipts going up and down the country from uh, Hampshire to Portsmouth. They looked at text messages and they were able to actually construct an entire case based on the evidence through technology. So it's interesting because my work in the non-punishment field really enabled that type of prosecution through the understanding that victims must not be punished and prosecuted. But also, it's the flip side that without the victim's testimony or without their intelligence or without their evidence, how can you bring down the gangs themselves? I know that that's what Anjali has been looking at in the Alan Turing Institute as well. Yeah, Anjali, do you want to respond to that? Thank you very much for that um, emotive narrative. It's very helpful for our audience and our listeners and viewers to have these very specific cases that they can sure. understand what's at stake. But Anjali, um, so I understand Parosha to be saying that, you know, 
law enforcement hasn't really been trained properly to even know what is evidence because the digital ha has not historically or traditionally formed part of their review. So can I just correct yeah. that? It, no. They hadn't been. They are trained now. Right. So in that sense, there's been progress. Absolutely. Right. And these cases have pr pr presumably assisted that progress. So that's, that's something good, that's a tick. But you work in actual AI design, so you're identifying, um, you're looking at digital evidence from a slightly different perspective, if I understand it, which is perhaps, um, well, you tell me, you're the expert. <laughs> I do, but uh, maybe I'll go back a little bit historically, since um, I, in the past, over 10 years ago, worked at the UK's Forensic Science Service. And so, that was where we were also well, developing uh, statistical methods for DNA evidence, for fingerprints, for digital evidence as well. And so even then, 10 years ago, we were looking at digital evidence, but think to understand a few things. One is, what are we talking about, Anna, you asked, in terms of digital evidence? Mm -hmm. And there was the evidence that is on mobile phones or on devices, on computers, on um, iPads, laptops, etc. Uh, and there's an issue about whether or not it can be collected, extracted. So there's legal issues about how you might do that, which Prosha can probably <laughs> speak to um, if you need a court order or warrant of some sort. Mm -hmm. But then there is, are you physically able to access it, mm -hmm. is one of the first issues. So one of the questions we would always, I would get asked is, we can't, get the data and I was like well I, I can't physically get it off for you that's not my role um, but once you've been able to extract the data then it's trying to make sense of all the data that is sitting on the device right uh, and so if we're talking about a mobile phone as sort of Parosha has um, shared is that we are looking at things these are communications between people uh, whether that's in the form of text messages, emails, images being sent, mm -hmm. uh, there's uh, call logs, all of that provides an evidence base, um, an evidence base of who's communicating with whom. So if we're talking about a network of people, uh, how is that happening? We're also getting additional information through not just who's communicating with whom, but the types of, it, the types of communication. So is it images? Is it is that evidence of something um, mm -hmm. criminal in itself? So all of these provide an, an evidence base. Now, the other issues that we deal with in the evaluation of that evidence for courts is also considering it's a connection with a mobile phone. Does that necessarily connect you to an individual? So people will challenge things, well, it wasn't my mobile phone or it was someone else's, is our, our questions or issues that we have dealt with. Uh, so we are, this is the intersection of physical evidence um, as well with uh, the more digital age. But the, the digital data is also that data that's sitting on the web. So recruitment is happening on online sources and sites. How can we better access that? We know that it's also happening through Facebook and various other um, apps and tech, you know, platforms. Mm -hmm. So there is a question about how to access that data um, and how technology uh, firm companies can better work with law enforcement. Mm -hmm. and we can all work, come together in sharing that data in a way that's also safe. It's not. Um, it's still with the aim of safeguarding people and society from harms. Yeah, I, in a similar conversation, uh, not part of this series, I was talking to cybersecurity uh, experts who tell me that after the COVID pandemic, there's been this exponential, ex well, an explosion in, in cybercrime, counterfeit, fraud, but I assume also um, exploitation of, of, of adults and children. Um, and it really, it really was pr made very clear to me that, that, that now, with so much of our lives being online, of course, much, much of our criminal activity is also uh, conducted online. So then data becomes really important, and tech and AI um, as, as a way of facilitating criminals and also tracking and tracing them. It, it, the problem is, though, that the cyber world is 
everywhere. It's a virtual reality. It's not um, or- organised or framed by nation-state boundaries. Obviously, trafficking, by definition, crosses boundaries, doesn't it? Not in all cases. Not in all we cases. We have internal trafficking as well as international. Oh, that's, that's interesting. Yeah. What, what do you mean by inter- internal so trafficking? One of the things that a lot of people get confused by is what is smuggling <laughs> and what is human trafficking. And so we sometimes come up with a few you know, kind of key take-homes on that. One is that in the case of human trafficking, we're always looking at the intention to exploit the human being at the end of the destination or, uh, you know, uh, to take their human service, whether it's, yeah. you know, slavery, servitude, forced labour, etc. It's the intention to exploit that underpins human trafficking, whereas smuggling is a, a, a transaction, a financial transaction to enable someone to cross an international border. Uh, with the aim that once they're over that border, they usually go free. A um, couple of points uh, I'd add to that is that um, in human trafficking, we also have cases of internal trafficking. We have any, so the county lines cases are trafficking cases because the children were being transported, recruited, um, transferred across the UK. Um, so that's, another, that's an important thing. In some cases, though, when it comes to international cases, we have a blurring between trafficking and smuggling, mm-hmm. where what becomes or what starts off as a smuggling case then may become a trafficking case when somebody along the line decides that they're going to exploit the person. But I just want to come to the point that you are, you are very validly raising, which is the increase in vulnerability of victims to being trafficked and subjected to... Uh, severe forms of exploitation during the COVID pandemic. Um, Well, obviously, you know, the technology has been used as a way by traffickers to recruit people for a long time, um, through Facebook or or, or through texts, through, you know, various forms. But we've also been now subjected to to technology on an enforced level because of the pandemic, each one of us, Mm -hmm. uh, to be at home to be communicating by whether it's Zoom or Teams or however you're doing it. And adults have been uh, therefore restricted in their homes uh, to the extent of then having to find those who are criminal, find better ways to um, uh, enable um, them to profit from exploitation. We've also had children, of course, uh, at home. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so where there's an abusive relationship or there's a a propensity to abuse, um, there are cases that have been documented and instances by the UN over the COVID pandemic of an increase of child sexual exploitation online. Mm. But also we've had cases involving many different types. I think what uh, of exploitation, and, and it's not just exploitation, I think what the pandemic has done is made uh, traffickers more able to advertise um, uh, through the internet for uh, um, exploitation to their punters. It's made it easier for them to exploit because they can then enable exploitation to ca- take place in a closed environment, which is then streamed through the world. It enables them to control victims more mm-hmm. because if they've got, for example, sexual content, whether it's male or female, they can be threatening to release it. It makes it difficult for victims to um, achieve redress or remedy or recovery from trauma because the victims know that the images are being um, replicated again and again. And whilst traffickers are becoming better and better at all of these things, the world community that is engaged in combating trafficking has not become so sophisticated. That's so exactly went to the heart of my question that I, I was, that you, you took me there. Uh, thank thank you. you, which is that yes, we, 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 we're still working with traditional frameworks, nation states as the legal framework, traditional law enforcement, although you say there's been some progress uh, in some areas, uh, but also just the, you know, the lack of international c- collaboration. And Ultimately, which is why we're sitting here, the lack of multidisciplinary com- 
collaboration. So I, I wonder if you could just brainstorm together on stage what, what needs to change, what do we need to see more of, which disciplines need to speak to each other and why, and how can it operate at an international level um, if we're all just so st sitting and talking uh, you know, to, our, to our, own, our own countrymen, if you like. And finally, I suppose the question would be, um, is there a way of... Uh, is there, is there a way of, of um, sort of imagining a new type of legal paradigm almost? Um, but this speaks more perhaps to your work, Parosha, but you might also be able to contribute to the way in which law needs to take tech more seriously. I've asked a lot of questions, but let's, let's just say what needs to change? What needs to happen? Because this is just getting worse as a set of yes. problems. Well, yeah. One thing, if yeah. I may add to what I was saying, I was giving a lot of examples there, and actually I realised that uh, one example I, I omitted that I wanted to say is that in a lot of cases, which had nothing to do with sexual exploitation, we've also got um, cases of domestic servitude, where during the pandemic the victims have then been absolutely restrained and contained by the ab abuser. So it's been very difficult for them to escape uh, and so there are questions as to what advancements tech can mm -hmm. be involved in to enable victims to have a voice and to be protected. But before I get to that, I wanted to mention something, that there isn't one cure. And so I think we shouldn't be thinking of tech being the cure mm -hmm. to combat trafficking. Tech is just one thing that is necessary to look at when we're looking at combating trafficking. Because trafficking prosecutions the world over have been decreasing by almost 50% in the last like four or five years anyway. It's because it's a complex crime that's hard enough to detect. But yes, we need tools to enable people to be vet better protected against trafficking and for perpetrators to be um, prosecuted. In my view, if we were to look at something multidisciplinary, we perhaps should engage support uh, organisations for victims um, because the victims' voices are so important in this field. Uh, we're talking about cases of prosecution and where there's an investigation by the police, but in a lot of cases, there hasn't been an investigation by the police. There hasn't been a mm. prosecution. But those victims who are with... NGOs, they will have given their accounts uh, as to what happened to them. And that can be intelligence that can feed into our understanding as to how they were recruited, where they were recruited, by what means, what made them vulnerable to be recruited in the first place, and to understand how technology comes into the story of human trafficking mm -hmm. more, to then be able to better address how technology yes. assists. Yes, Anjali, that seems to resonate with you quite strongly. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. It, it does. Um, <laughs> I might just go back to a couple of Parosha's earlier points in this, um, the space that we're in in terms of um, the digital evidence, digital world. And getting back to one of the challenges that I see is that we have now perpetrators that could be sitting anywhere and victims that could be anywhere in the world, and, and depending on how you want to define a perpetrator too, it's the people that are, um, you know, using the, the sex advert websites to the ones that are potentially more the coercer, the pimp, however <laughs> you want to define, mm -hmm. but or however you want to define people, that that's now international. You don't physically have to move someone, but that exploitation is happening, and that's what we've seen through COVID too, as you were um, sharing, is that some of that had that increased during during COVID, and also the types of exploitation. So we saw an increase in terms of what was happening online, but also the the extent to which it was happening. Videos were um, were being uploaded more. So this goes back to the the potential harms that are longer lasting in some way that it is physically able. We know that trauma lasts a long time, but this is one that could potentially last even further when we don't have cooperation to take some of these images or videos uh, down as well. Um, but to move over to the sort of multidisciplinarity and what we can do, I, it completely resonates with me in terms of what Parosha was saying in terms of the engagement with 
the community that's actually most impacted by this, those that have been exploited. Uh, and this goes to, I guess, my work around what I mean by AI for human rights. Yes, I was actually both mind readers <laughs> in terms of my question. That was a good segue. <laughs> I, I, I would like you to talk about it. AI for human rights and, 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 and also a little bit, Parosha, if you wouldn't mind also following up with a bit about some of the laws that you've been involved in drafting as well, so that we can see what innovations are happening from both of your uh, perspective. So, yes, what is AI, uh, AI for human rights and why is it for human rights? <laughs> well, if you think about AI and human rights, <laughs> often you uh, get a negative sort of resonance with it. People think that it's um, discriminatory, that it's uh, potentially issues of privacy, surveillance is what comes to people's minds. And while those are definitely the risks and the potential harms and we want to mitigate against those, my is also to consider how AI can really um, both address and support human rights as well as what are the considerations. So this is really thinking about our moral and social values. Um, so not just talking about human rights from sort of a case law perspective, but really about human dignity and those values and how we can really embed that. So these are approaches thinking about um, what we call um, uh, value-centered design and participatory uh, methods and approaches, which is really thinking about what are these values? What are the norms or behavior? So if we think about um, one of the concerns around data is often issues of privacy, um, and, uh, then you can think about, well, what are the um, ways that we could, um, the behaviors or the norms, such as, so is that the opportunity to, to opt in or opt out of issues? So how long is that data going to um, be retained? Uh, if it's, when we're talking about data sharing, again, whether that's across um, organizations, what is that way of sharing that data in a way that is still um, preserving uh, data protection and privacy mm -hmm. issues? So, and then that enables sort of the technical requirements. So that's one part of it. The other bit is the whole participatory approach to it. And we talk about that often as stakeholders, but stakeholders sometimes can mean we're talking about uh, the tech company with law enforcement, maybe research organizations. Uh, but that group that we're missing are the, are the individuals that have been exploited. Um, and so that's where my interest is that that stakeholder is really that engagement with the community and how do we have survivors or in, in the case of some of the work on sexual exploitation online is sex workers as well, making sure that they're actually informing throughout the process of the technologies that we're trying to design as part of it so that we get their, their understanding, what are the needs, they help to determine um, what are the requirements we should be putting in place? And so so fascinating. I mean, you know, I think in the common imagination, probably since the publication of Frankenstein, we have this idea that technical innovation and is is somehow at loggerheads with human ethics. And you're talking about embedding ethical values in the very design of, of the tech that we use and rely on. And and, and, and similarly, Parosha, you're, you, you, you've seen the need to sort of embed that ethical commitment based on what you know about the survivors, the victims, the, the human stories that you've been exposed to. How do you embed that in the design of the law? You've actually drafted model laws, yeah. I believe, in Uganda and places yeah. where there is a real problem. Maybe you could say a little bit about that before sure, we wrap up. Sure, sure. So, um, yeah, just coming at it from a straightforward human rights perspective, uh, the first time, so as, as barrister, usually, as you know, barrister yourself, like, you know, we don't get involved in drafting legislation. But for me, um, the opportunity first arose uh, at, in looking at laws in 2008. So a case that I represented in um, was a case where the Metropolitan Police had not uh, investigated a human trafficker, even though there was a lot of evidence. And so I prosecuted the police in civil proceedings for failing to investigate. Um, and the chief um, 
commissioner of the Metropolitan Police actually settled the case mm. without a confidentiality order, agreed that he had breached the obligation to investigate. And, um, uh, and what was interesting about the case, it was a case of domestic servitude, um, which was not being really focused on by the police as a crime. They were really looking at sex trafficking back then and not any, uh, really any other form of exploitation. It occurred to me when looking at that, as it did to a few others at that sp specific time, that there was no freestanding criminal offence of slavery or s uh, servitude in the UK or forced labour. We'd criminalised human trafficking for, for, for uh, sexual exploitation in 2003 and for all forms of exploitation in 2004, but we didn't actually have a freestanding criminal offence of holding a person in slavery or servitude or requiring a person to perform forced labour. And so um, I advised a peer in the House of Lords, Baroness Young of Hornsey, on this on behalf of Anti-Slavery International, and she brought an amendment uh, to a criminal justice bill that was going through Parliament, and it led to Section 79 of the Coroners and Justice Act 2009, which is our freestanding offence of slavery, servitude and forced labour, which was fascinating because actually we had abolished the transatlantic slave trade 200 years before, but had forgotten to actually criminalise slavery on our own doorstep. Uh, it was so successful as a corollary to the human trafficking offences that when the Modern Slavery Act was passed in 2012, it became Section 1 of the Modern Slavery Act. Section 2 is human trafficking. So subsequently to that, I was asked to advise as well on the Scottish uh, uh, Bill on Trafficking, also on the Northern Ireland Bill. I went and gave evidence in Stormont. And then since 2017, I've been advising a number of Commonwealth states, uh, including Uganda, on amending their laws to better encompass and encapsulate forms of trafficking that are going on in modern slavery at the moment that are not really um, targeted by their existing laws. So, for example, one of the things that has been happening across Asia and across Africa has been the proliferation of recruitment companies that are targeting quite well-educated, in many cases, youths to go to the Middle East where they could get a good job uh, as uh, any type of job. It might be as a, uh, as a professional or as an office worker or as an IT or anything like that. And because there's such a small number of jobs and at such a high level of unemployment in a lot of these countries where the recruitment companies are targeting, um, youth are going through the online recruitment offered by recruitment companies to the Middle East yeah. where it is then uh, exposed, usually through Facebook or through a, a video that they send to mum and dad back home, that they've been tortured, they've been abused, uh, and in all cases they've been enslaved. And so I have been focusing on drafting some legal provisions to help countries where this is happening to um, amend their laws, to try to bring some of the corporations to account uh, and to introduce corporate criminal liability so I'm in the middle of that process at the moment. Um, but also, uh, I was advising recently LUMOS, J.K. Rowling's Children's Foundation. Um, they were looking at orphanages, which are set up by criminal networks uh, to obtain humanitarian aid and private donor funding for the sole purpose of profit in their po pockets. So they recruit vulnerable children and put them in the orphanages. They don't give them care or attention. They pretend that they're going to and they obtain funding uh, uh, and the children are abused. But none of the trafficking laws are really uh, targeting that form of exploitation. So I've drafted a model law against orphanage trafficking. It's actually institutionalised childcare trafficking. And it's going to be published in the next uh, month, I, I think. Um, so, yeah, for me, I'm always been, you know, since this interaction began, began um, very interested in the work that Alan Turing Foundation uh, and Andrea's lead is involved in and potentially whether or not we could have an interaction to look at a, a few things. One would be interesting, which would be looking at different cases from different countries, potentially, 
and seeing the type of online and digital recruitment or exploitation that takes place and all, also the type of prosecutorial uh, approaches to these cases because there won't always be prosecutions, but we, we can unpick and unwrap un un some of these cases without them. It would also be very interesting to look at what um, internet laws there are in the countries where there is a, a lot of, or, or seems to be a lot of um, trafficking that is done online. Now, there's really no international treaty on this uh, and yet the question is whether there should be mm. because if we're talking about the victim being a human being then it doesn't matter where they were recruited from or by whom or for what purpose if it's done through the internet which is everywhere including here each victim should have a chance of protection of potential investigation prosecution of their perpetrator and of the potential victims the entitlement to prevention remedy uh, strategies to, to, to stop it at its uh, core yeah. so these are just some thoughts I have and, and potentially you know looking at drafting certain models because you haven't got that much going on at the moment I said I mean listen you, you, we'll you just head off and <laughs> <laughs> I, I have to be care I have to be really careful because you know my, my, my intention is to wrap up and and to we are, we're going to open it up to questions and I want there to be a relaxed environment you have subjected us though to the most appalling stories of human cruelty and I, I, I find myself flawed every time I talk to you because I just, it, you bring it home and you bring it home so uh, articulately and eloquently and I, I don't want to be playful on the back of those stories but I do want to be playful in saying that you know I feel a bit like Scylla Black here, I want the two of you to get together um, and I want you to find some common ground that perhaps if there is a mysterious benefactor in the universe who would be willing to support some of the projects that um, Parosha has outlined, would that be of interest to you? Or do you have uh, alternative suggestions that we can workshop and brainstorm before we turn to questions? Well, I, the, the first one in terms of um, just looking into cases, um, and, and cases are both the legal cases that may have <laughs> been investigated versus uh, cases that actually haven't been investigated. Uh, as well, but that was something I raised a couple of years ago when the, the Policy and Evidence Centre for Modern Slavery and Human Rights um, was uh, set up two years ago, was that that would be an area of interest because we were also hearing, at least in the UK, that it was really difficult to link cases, it was difficult to know whether or not cases um, ended up in prosecution, um, just the connection yeah. of what that trail was. And for me, coming at it from the perspective that I've worked on cases, I mean, I started really on DNA evidence and sexual assault cases, that was my primary area, that uh, I really wanted to understand what evidence is being collected and could we also inform uh, both in terms of what evidence should be collected and then how can we better improve that evaluation of that evidence so that it could support in the prosecution. Um, and to also understand when we're hearing that Case, the number of cases are going up or down, what do they actually mean by that? Are cases being, it, when we, sometimes we hear that, you know, we're not getting, we don't have modern slavery convictions or that they're lower or fewer. What does that actually mean? Does that mean that a, a case was actually presented as a modern slavery case, but they decided they couldn't um, charge it or um, pursue it as a modern slavery case and it got shifted to a sexual assault case? It's understanding that so that we can really get to support in the justice system and in, in the victim's um, uh, justice. Yeah, I think that's so. ma a major takeaway for, for me today is that the importance of these definitions of these different phenomena seems to be so crucial because you're both... You're both working on teaching society to recognise what they're seeing and to know what they're seeing, and then once you know it, you can devise methods of 
tackling it. Um, but oh, I mean, and may I add something on that yeah. actually? Because we have used uh, the terms human trafficking and modern slavery in intermittently uh, throughout this conversation, which is right. But just for anyone in the audience who's interested or doesn't know, modern slavery is just an umbrella term for different forms of human exploitation. Uh, it, there's no legal definition of modern slavery as a term. It includes generally human trafficking, slavery, servitude, forced labour, debt bondage, um, other forms of exploitation, child marriage in some cases. Mm -hmm. it, it's really also, it can be um, identified by the forms of exploitation that happen in one country which may be different to another. Whereas human trafficking is a very specific legal I definition see. that is really about how a person is moved into a condition of exploitation. It's their recruitment, their receipt, their transportation, their harbouring or their transfer for the purpose of exploitation. I see. I can see why you're both so interested in ethics because all of these phenomena that you've just listed within the framework of this umbrella term are just where ethics is missing or absent. The, yes. the, the notion of human dignity is absent. The notion of, um, you know, respect or, or, or compensation or uh, basic human rights. And that's why it's so life. important when you have. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. But no, no. That's why it's so important to have the chance to introduce or restore the right to human dignity when you ha have an opportunity to do so, particularly in my field as a lawyer. Uh, and so, in my case, that I started off the, this conversation with in AN, just coming back to him when I mentioned that there was evidence on his phone. I'm, uh, he was willingly giving that as intelligence. My phone has got this information. And so he, he was consenting to the yes. use of that evidence, which is a different case to the one that Anjali was originally talking about, which is you've got a computer, it's got evidence or intelligence on it. Do you have the right to take it? And the cases that I'm talking about, where we're going to hopefully be able to ask support organisations to assist with understanding how technology is mm. used to recruit or to advertise or to exploit mm. or to control, these are cases that we would like to have the consent of any victim of the exploitation to be uh, ha happy to share yeah. that information because it can help other cases yeah. and it can help us understand. So. Ethics needs to be seen in the way that consent is a very important aspect mm. of the obtaining of evidence in that way. But on the other hand, where it's just in the ether and it's there very much, um, you know, through, for example, Facebook, um, traffickers being able to use algorithms or use uh, club names or chat room names between themselves to, you know, um, find victims, yeah. then that is evidence that law enforcement uh, and anyone interested in this field should be focusing on to obtain and grab hold of. Yeah, really good summary of what, yeah, the, the landscapes that have to be mapped from, from different disciplinary angles. So are you both agreed that there is work to be done and that... <laughs> This conversation might be a, a useful starting point on some level for thinking about projects that would help tackle what seems to be an, a, a truly horrifying, uh, growing problem, uh, if we just call it exploitation of human beings across the world through um, these various uh, technical channels that are not mapped effectively or tackled effectively by law. Um, seem, I, yes, Anjali, please. Sorry, I just wanted to pick up. I mean, this is going back to... Um, some of Prosha's earlier points too is there there is a wealth of intelligence of information that is sitting in victims' narratives, right? When they they report what's happened, let alone in their devices. And we still don't know how to make the best use of that information, both to understand the drivers and factors as well as to use it, I think, in, in courts. And that's where I think we really need to come together to sort of understand how we can best do that. Um, and where are both the, the legal sort of enablers and the, the tech enablers? Yes. But it's also to the point of, you know, tech is, is not a silver bullet. So I'm ost often asked, is AI the silver bullet? And it's not. Um, no. And so it's recognizing for me that this is about 
a multidisciplinary, a multi-sector, um, and a, a really sort of inclusive approach to kind of tackling and addressing these issues. Yes, and can I add to that as well? I think it's also about training as well, law enforcement, because sometimes things are, are there and there's already training for some um, forces of the police, but not others. So, for example, if you're looking at organised crime or you're looking at money crime, big money crime, mm. um, many of the teams in different police forces across the world will be very well trained and adept in chasing the money, freezing assets, you know, and, and yet quite the question is, you know, how well are the trafficking cops trained in that? Uh, the relevance being as well that when it comes to digital um, evidence uh, and uh, technology, more and more it's the money transfers as well that are taking place and we need to have a grip on that too because ultimately whenever a case can be brought we do want to see compensation for victims of trafficking from the perpetrators. You know, if, if there is no possibility to obtain it from the perpetrator for some reason, then the state should be responsible to compensate the victim. But we need to be really following the money in these cases. And so what I think as well is looking at, potentially, you know, which um, areas are lacking in training uh, in terms of intelligence-led policing when it comes to investigating money flows. Yeah, I mean, we've been doing some work, um, starting some work in, in that area. One is um, with a few police forces just understanding um, the work that they do, the gaps that they have. And some of that is um, where they, there's a gap in terms of the technical expertise to really extract and, and make sense of the digital evidence, that data. Uh, but part of it, too, is they're not sure what they're allowed to do. What are those legal <laughs> Um, barriers or an enablers that would allow them to do it. Part of it is also, again, where some of this is sitting in private institutions. So whether we're talking about tech companies, whether we're talking about financial institutions, so where we're talking about following the money, which is one of the pieces of work that we're, we're looking at, is we recognize that people, um, perpetrators are exploiting people in multiple ways and just understanding how they're doing that, like how they're controlling accounts, how they're moving the money. Um, with vic even using victims' names, um, but actually they have the control over it. All of those things are, are opportunities where we can really use, again, data science and machine learning methods to understand what are those patterns, what are those behaviors kind of detected, um, which forms not only for an investigation, but also for evidence to be, ad to be admitted. It so. It's so interesting to listen to people talk about their own fields because, you know, we all know that there's human trafficking in the world in one form or another and we're all aware of the internet and everybody's aware. When you say follow the money and then you follow up on that, it's obvious when you think about it. But it's counterintuitive to really think about it. I think a lot of people have no idea about what's going on and how endemic it is. And it's, there's a very special way in which people who are thoroughly embedded in their disciplines who are working on these issues from totally different perspectives but on the same issues, how revealing everything you say is and how it casts a new light on the same questions we think we all understand because you're dealing with real human beings. So you've got these very real stories and images in your head. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's very rare for people to have the opportunity to listen to people speaking on the same issues from radically different perspectives. I think it's absolutely to the credit of King's College London and the Alan Turing Institute that they've hosted this event. And I do hope to see more of it in future because I think it's genuinely enlightening for the public and it helps experts like yourselves sort of check their own thinking as well. Like this is how it feels from a barrister perspective but now that you speak as, a, as an AI designer, I'm, I'm, my mind's thinking maybe slightly differently about what needs to change, and I really, and, and, and obviously vice versa. So watching that interaction has just been very insightful for me, and I, I really am thankful to both of you and to our two host institutions for making this possible. We do have some time for questions. I know, um, Parosha, you, you have to rush off on time, so I don't want you to, um, I don't want to run over time, but I, I think we have time for some questions. If I can work out how to do this swanky question thing. <laughs> um, right, here we go. Anna speaks of international flows of exploitation, but are there any geographical patterns? Does this phenomenon map 
onto the unequal power relations of Global North, Global South, for example. Who would like to tackle that? I, I could just give two examples um, really at the top of my mind. The answer is yes, there are some geographical flows. So, for example, um, what we f when it, I'll give you an example of sexual exploitation in Britain. Uh, we were finding that um, a lot of Nigerian victims of uh, sexual exploitation were being uh, recruited from a particular state in Nigeria, um, Edo State, uh, and trafficked to Britain and through to Italy. And when we were looking, when I say we, I call, I'm saying we as a, as a community mm -hmm. of human trafficking experts, um, but when the police were looking at investigating this, they found that the control mechanisms were juju, the, the type of um, witchcraft um, spells that traffickers were putting the girls under, which made them really fearful and, in, in fact, it, impossible for them to um, uh, escape because they were having the, what they considered to be the blood of the juju spirit crushed into their veins through um, a, a ceremony that involved a particular soot being obtained and put under the skin. Uh, but however, it was possible to get an anthropologist to give evidence in a criminal trial of Anthony Harrison a few years ago, who was put away for 24 years uh, as the first uh, human trafficker from Nigeria uh, in Britain. And so that was the flow. Uh, when it comes to uh, forced labour, of course, uh, it's well documented that we see a proliferate, not proliferate, we've seen a, an absolute spate of human trafficking from uh, impoverished countries um, to the Middle East for forced labour on the construction sites. You know, you can just Google forced labour, construction site, human trafficking, and you can find it all there. And so, uh, again, these are, there are very particular routes of countries, uh, Bangladesh, Nepal, where people have been put under very high levels of debt bondage in order to get these jobs, and then they go thinking they're going to be able to make money for the family back home, but in fact they're enslaved and they're not paid. Uh, and in fact, they're then uh, subject to even more debt bondage where they're made to pay for accommodation, which is uh, prison-like. Horrendous. Do you have anything to add to that question? There's it's quite a techie one coming up, so I don't know if... <laughs> <laughs> I so what know. shall we hold off for the... <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I don't know if... So, are you mainly focusing on post-analysis once trafficking is found out, or also preventative analysis? If yes, what data, what tools, what algorithms? Uh, Maybe you could translate the question for some of us. Exactly. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll see if I translate this to the, to the, um, the requesters' <laughs> liking. Uh, so we, we are looking at it from a uh, preventative perspective. So that is just looking at the data that's out there. This could be a combination of administrative data. So data that's sitting in NGOs um, to... Uh, data that's sitting in law enforcement, that's uh, sitting in the private sector, all of that is to really understand the behaviors, right? What are the patterns? What are the behaviors that can help us to determine uh, policy interventions, mm -hmm. right? Points where we could intervene. Where are those um, uh, potentially vulnerable points? Um, you could, even when we were sharing earlier about the, the, the stories that a survivor might share, you can better understand um, what were different points in their life that might have made um, opportunities more riskier, right? So you could have an economic downturn in, in the household, which means that people are going further distances, they're leaving home, they're, they're going into more isolated situations for uh, basically providing for themselves or for their families um, for economic opportunity. All of these things are potentially intervening points, which we need to think about, well, what are those intervening points that we should be considering and, and the policies that could come into place? The others, of course, are around, um, we, when we were talking about the sexual exploitation online, that's all part of it, but they're already in an exploitative situation, potentially. Uh, and so then that is really about detecting it. and. Uh, supporting law enforcement in being able to detect it and, and intervene during that process rather than the, the pre part of just of understanding the drivers and, and factors more generally. And then there is the part about um, methods of, I 
I think the part around um, once a case is already there, that evaluation of evidence is really critical, and I think it goes to a point that Parosha was saying earlier, which is, you know, what's the opportunity that not only we're, we're providing this um, evidence to make it as um, uh, robust as possible uh, to demonstrate all the connections and links and, and its relevance to the criminal charge at hand, but also can this reduce the um, burden on the victim that have to retell their story, mm. right? And, and put the pressure of what that evidence base is. So how much can we be doing to support that is really where I see we can also be putting more of an emphasis on in the work that we do. Uh, it was a good question, actually, for shedding light on how the, the, the sort of AI design can feed into how laws and policies are, are written. Yeah. I saw the glimmer of a of how that might work in the answer to that question. Just going, yeah. sorry, just to maybe complete the... <laughs> yeah. I think in terms of data, it's not just administrative data. The fact of the matter is digital technology is also meant we're using satellite imagery data. We're using uh, mobile... We, there's the opportunity to use mobile phone and, and telco data, so mobile money data in, say, African countries where you know that's the way they move money around. All of those are digital traces and data that can be used. Um, so there, there's a, a vast opportunity to really sort of make use of data and we're, we're, we're trying to... Yeah. Um, well, the, ne the next question kind of follows on from that, but I think both of you might speak to it in interesting ways. So, Angela, you mentioned that it's important to think of good design that actually disables trafficking by nature. How would this be done in practice? <laughs> And what experts would contribute to this design? Would you need sociologists, lawyers, cybersecurity experts? What sorts of experts? I think that's Good definitely question. a question for Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm a lawyer, well, a yeah. tech well, expert. Well, we could assume that you'd <laughs> be one of the experts <laughs> yes. needed. Yes. Well, exactly. And so one of the experts... So when I look at how to design some of these projects, it is really thinking not just, as I said, the, the whole... Um, the different sectors of so the private and the public and um, the policy sector, the NGOs and our community, the community most impacted, but it's that most multidisciplinary team. So yeah. yes, we have the data scientists who will often be of a math, statistics, computer science ilk, <laughs> mm -hmm. shall we say. Uh, but um, as part of that, for me, it's important that we have law people. So Parosha is <laughs> one of those critical uh, people that's needed on the team, uh, often ethics, often an anthropologist, so I have anthropo an anthropologist yeah. on the team. Um, we have, uh, so some people are also now entering the data science and AI field also from different disciplines, right? They're not just entering it through the math, statistics, computer mm. science fields themselves. And so uh, one of the postdoctoral researchers who's been working with me on the work on sexual exploitation online actually came through psychology, in the real behavioral science, but has also trained in machine learning methods. Mm. And so she can bring both of those perspectives into it to really understand. And I think that's what's important. We also need the domain experts, and those domain experts come both from an academic discipline who've been researching um, and understanding the space, but also those that are um, practitioners um, in law, such as Ferocia, um, but in law enforcement and um, those, so we work with Unseen, um, the UK's Modern Slavery Helpline. Um, so all of those have uh, domain expertise, which are critical to this. Fascinating. And I just, I think it's really important because as probably um, people in, in the technology space, we get excited by data, but we need to remember that the data is about people and that there is a context that we need to understand that in. And so that's what I hope people, in terms of thinking about AI for human rights, is that, that that's the critical piece. Uh, well, I think that, so. it, I, just to go back to the point I made about Frankenstein and the imagination, I think a lot of people would be very reassured, actually, to hear that you know, the Alan Turing takes people, not just data, seriously, and sees them as absolutely part of the same phenomenon. Because I think for a lot of people, there is that concern that there's a sort of machine approach, machine mind, sort of lacking in empathy, lacking in, you know, basic appreciation of human rights. And your conversation today shows that that's far from, from true. 
Um, there's an, an, I think we have to be careful with time, but I think we could have a question for Parosha and then a, a, a final question for both of you. Um, from Albert, because not everyone gives their name, but this is a question from Albert to, to Parosha. There is a well-documented slave labour... Oh, sorry, there is well-documented slave labour with the Qatar World Cup building of the stadiums, but it seems little is being done internationally to combat this. Is it a surprise to you that the Western world has turned its back on slavery on such a worldwide stage? You know, I love this question. This is something that I talk to... Um, my students about a lot. Um, so I would boil it down into two things really. One is called extraterritorial jurisdiction for crimes committed and the other is corporate criminal liability. So Albert you're absolutely right, uh, what has been going on is absolutely abhorrent and it's to me still incredible that there hasn't been any redress. However, if as a lawyer I'm forensic and I look at why there hasn't been any redress, mm -hmm. what I can see is that where we have companies operating in a country where there is a weak rule of law towards the protection of the human rights of migrant workers, we will have a straightforward um, opportunity taken by multinationals to profit from that environment. What's interesting, for example, is that if we had a British company um, that was domiciled in Britain, but had its subsidiaries involved in the uh, exploitation for forced labor of the migrant workers uh, in any one of these Middle Eastern countries where we've seen uh, forced labour take place on construction sites. I've noticed a massive gap in our Modern Slavery Act, which is that we have no extraterritorial jurisdiction for Section 1 of the Modern Slavery Act, which is for the offence of slavery, servitude and forced labour. When it is carried out, it's only criminally liable towards a person where it's carried out in Britain. So that's number one. Uh, number, I've, I've written about this actually in an article for The Guardian uh, a couple of years ago. It was a very short piece. I should probably write something again. Um, the second is corporate criminal liability. The world's trajectory since 2010, was it, when the California Act came in on transparency and supply chains, has been towards treating companies as form prefects where they have transparency and supply chains operating measures in place. Uh, so to praise companies is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. And certainly that is replicated in Section 54 of the Modern Slavery Act in Britain or transparency and supply chains provisions. But there is no corporate criminal liability in the Modern Slavery Act. Again, I've looked at it carefully and if we look at Section 5, which is on penalty, Section 5 or 6, forgive me, uh, viewers, if I get that wrong. Uh, but and, uh, the, my point being is that if we look at penalties, we only see imprisonment there, which is for a human being. What we don't see is corporate criminal liability style offences that we would see in Companies Act legislation. So again, this is something that I've been working on with some countries to introduce corporate criminal liability and extraterritorial jurisdiction. Mm. Um, and so whilst we see this as a terrible example of impunity, what has happened in Qatar to uh, those victims of forced labor, um, I, as anyone who knows me or has read about my work uh, knows, is I continually seek to uh, agitate for reform and development in these fields and it can be influential and we'll see how that goes. But uh, what we have seen in Qatar and um, in, to a lesser extent in some of the other countries is a change in the kafala system which is what enslaves people from the starting point of having to give your passport over to your employer and once you leave you then becoming an illegal migrant which is a grave propensity opportunity for abuse by an employer and actually on this point I'd like to come back to Britain because we have the same similar um, 
risk of exploitation for our domestic migrant workers since 2012, when we also have a tying of the visa to the employer for domestic migrant workers. And it's something that I have been supporting um, in terms of advocating against, along with Kalayan, um, which is the main charity on this, uh, and other experts. Thank you. That yeah, it's very enlightening from a lawyer's perspective as well to just have these very clear gaps in the law identified. Uh, it's and really it's not just in Britain where we don't have ETJ or corporate criminal liability. It's, it's everywhere. The, the, in, in a lot of countries. Some countries may have it be interesting to see how you know, the cases have played out, if at all. Well, that does bring us to our final question, um, which I hope both of you can speak to before we wrap up, um, which is, are there any case studies of international collaboration to alleviate modern slavery with countries working together to make changes that matter? I don't know who would like to... Well, leave. from my perspective, I, I know that, yes, there's been a number of joint investigation teams, which is uh, the um, name for uh, different... Uh, police forces in different countries coming together to bring down trafficking gangs. Uh, there was a very uh, successful JIT um, between Britain and Hungary when Britain was a member of the European Union because these JITs were European Commission funded and that was looking at the trafficking of uh, vulnerable Hungarian women into Britain for sham marriages um, and um, you know, that would then lead to immigration status uh, and trafficking rooms were running those um, uh, exploitation um, uh, conduits. So that, that was very good. We had, there was an incredibly successful one. It, so it seemed in relation to Romania of the trafficking of hundreds actually of Romanian children uh, in around, what was it? 2008 or 9, maybe a bit earlier, but a bit earlier where they were used for um, volume thefts on the underground. And it was then discovered that they were being um, controlled by very, very uh, organised criminal networks from Romania. And that was the first JIT between Britain and Romania, which was apparently successful because we got a number of prosecutions in Britain and a number of prosecutions in Romania. Only for um, last year, all of the convictions in Romania to be overturned, which is a question in itself. So if anyone wants to read about this, it's called Operation Golf. That was the uh, police, Metropolitan Police investigation into those cases. And uh, there's a lot of questions over why um, there wasn't proper accountability for all those responsible. Let's just say. Extraordinarily interesting. I, before I trained as a barrister, I was a historian, European historian, and uh, I specialised in Central Europe. And I, 19th century, uh, what was known as the white slave trade was conducted primarily out of Romania and Hungary. So it, it just, as you're speaking, I'm thinking these are perhaps very well established international criminal networks that have been around for yes. perhaps centuries. And I'm just giving a couple of examples, of course, because there are very, very uh, successful. Um, you know, joint investigation teams that involved um, Ghana and Britain, Nigeria and Britain, so different countries as well. If anyone's interested to look up uh, the Peace Sandiford case, that was the first baby that was trafficked into England um, for benefit for somebody to declare it as their own biological child for benefit fraud. Uh, and that it involved an uh, investigation team jointly between countries. But yeah, there's a lot, there's quite a few. Which is reassuring, yes. So, Anjali, international collaborations that you're aware of? So, Dismal failures, successes? <laughs> <laughs> a mixture. So I, I guess I would say that I, I think um, where Parosha is really demonstrating is that there have been the, the international collaborations on, on cases or particular events and situations. And I think where I'm still seeing the gap, I'll say, is how we bring in the technological kind of collaboration into these international spaces. Um, but what we are seeing is tech companies are coming together. So there's Tech Against Trafficking, which is a consortium of tech companies that are looking at how they can work with various organizations, in UN organizations, um, some of the um, uh, NGOs that are all focused around uh, um, 
addressing modern slavery and human trafficking. There, uh, the Turing Institute, we've been involved, um, we helped to establish Code 8.7, uh, which was also looking at how we could bring uh, different organizations. This was not just the tech companies and research organizations, but also um, NGOs, recognizing that NGOs are holding this data, they could also make better use of tech, um, but didn't necessarily have the resources or know how um, tech uh, could, could help. Um, so that has been an effort that was uh, started just two and a half, almost three years ago now, uh, which again is a consortium of people um, and organizations that come together. We, we launched an event at the UN in early 2019 uh, to, really, to really bring people together of these diverse groups to think about how can we come together. And, and that's building up different partnerships um, and some of that is uh, like international partnerships and that some of that is with countries. So I'd like to see more of that and see how we could do that more internationally. And so there, but there's learning, right? Because what we see is also some countries have been doing a phenomenal job to make use of their own data and to better understand, oh, they're being exploited in one area, they're, you know, they're being um, identified in one area and exploited in another and being moved, um, both within their own country and internationally. And the more that we can do that and learn from each other, I think we'll, yeah. we'll have a chance. Of yeah, it's a very good final question because it allowed you both to sort of um, make the audience aware of, of resources and, and initiatives that are actually going on that people might be interested in learning more about. I suppose we could um, attach some of these links, including your Guardian piece, uh, things that come up are relevant to the conversation. We can we can attach links to the to the the, the links to the recording, and. Um, uh, I'm told that the recording of this live event will be available at Turing Inst, which I think the, the Twitter handle is available in the chat. Um, and this conversation also um, forms part of our rebranded legal podcast, The Verdict, at King's College London. So you'll be able to access this conversation there when we relaunch in October. And that will be uh, available for you to follow uh, at KCL underscore law. Uh, so look out for the verdict and, and you'll find other podcasts there that do link to some of the issues that we've been talking about today. Specifically, I mentioned the one on cybersecurity, which you both, you both might enjoy. Um, uh, so I, it just leaves me to say once again a huge thank you uh, to the hosts of this uh, conversation, um, the Alan Turing Institute and King's College London, the Law School at King's College London. I would also like to make sure that Everybody uh, is aware of how much organisation something like this takes. It's been made to look effortless. We've had a really good comms team, tech team from both institutes who've worked together brilliantly to make this uh, happen. And of course, my heartfelt thanks to both of you. I know how busy you both are and you've been wonderfully cooperative in getting this together and making time for it and being generous with your thoughts and your experience. And I think the world's a better place for it. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much. And uh, I hope you enjoyed the conversation.